Welcome to the Money Insights Podcast, where high income earners come to learn wealth building strategies that will take them from high income to high net worth. With your hosts, financial and wealth building experts, Christian Allen and Rod Zabriskie. Welcome into another episode of the Money Insights Podcast, where we talk all things money and business. My name is Christian Allen. I'm here with my co host, business partner, and friend. Rodney the Pod Zabriski. What's up, Rod? Hey, I'm doing great. And uh, I know I've been teasing this for a few months now, but my daughter Julianne had her baby. Mm, 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 mm. Congratulations. We have I know. a new mom, but more importantly, a new <laughs> grandfather. Yeah. Well, and I have to tell you, though, that that's actually the part that was the weirdest. Like anticipating having a grandchild is really where my mind was. But then as soon as I found out that she she'd had the little girl, I was like, wow, my my little girl is a mom. Oh, like, that, that was yeah, that's wild. A, whoo. OK, well, so. I'm both looking forward to and not looking forward to that day. Rod. <laughs> OK, OK, well, congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, that's you. super cool. Yeah, um, OK, awesome. Rod, today we're going to talk about why Ed Slot says IRAs are dead. I can't this wait. is Ed Slot, the IRA guy, right? Yeah. This isn't just anybody. He is America's IRA expert, and he says yeah. IRAs are dead. He also says, he also talks about why he likes life insurance more than IRAs. Woo! That's crazy. It's big. It's yep, big we're, news. And we're going to jump into it. Okay, so a little bit of context for this. I was listening to a training that Ed Slot did, and mm -hmm. it just happened to be that it was right in line with all the things we believe and talk about. And I thought, well, this is great. We'll just have Ed Slot validate our, our, our strategies and philosophies. And that's probably better than one of us doing it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people are used to hearing us do that, right? Yeah. But like, Ed's like a national celebrity. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? He's he's the real deal. Okay. So I will say this. I do think Ed Slot uh, um, puts out a lot of good material. And he is genuinely an IRA expert. What makes him unique is that he's not a financial advisor. He's a CPA mm -hmm. who teaches financial advisors and other people how to effectively help people plan specifically around IRAs. So this was why I jumped into it just thinking, hey, I'll, maybe I'll catch a nugget here or there. But like, yeah. it was just a goldmine of all sorts of fun. Okay. So with that being our context, Rod, we're just going to jump right into it. So okay. here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to set the stage by talking about what's called the SECURE Act. Mm -hmm. And that sounds really boring, but Rod's going to make it sound fun. The SECURE Act and the death of stretch IRAs. Okay, mm -hmm. We're talking about that. Then we're going to talk about why high income earners are hit the hardest inside of this uh, stretch IRA uh, exclusion. Well, that's not the right word. The death. We're going to talk about <laughs> the death. Yeah, we're going to talk about why the death of, of the stretch IRA is most impactful yeah and i'll just give you a hint it's it's really easy it's because high income earners have the biggest iras yeah biggest tax burdens right and if you're not going to use your ira and you don't have a stretch option that means that you're just going to pay a lot of tax right okay. but, but we're going to get into that we're going to talk about why roth conversions are a good idea mm -hmm. right why and and again i'm I'm going to emphasize this, but why Ed thinks Roth conversions are a good idea. However, we're also going to talk about why Ed thinks life insurance conversions are even better than Roth conversions. Crazy. I like it. Okay. Okay. Let's do it, Rod. So maybe the starting point is to talk about what's a stretch IRA. Hit on that first. Okay. Stretch IRA. So uh, you have an IRA and you die. Good. Okay. And I, and, and I think maybe it's, it's clear, critical because a lot of people in their estate planning, they want to move these kinds of things outside of their estate. Well, you can't move an IRA out of your estate. It is an individual retirement account. Mm. Or if it's in a 401k, it's in your name. It can't be shifted to a trust or an LLC or, or any of these other things that we like to use with, with our estate planning. Therefore, it, it gets treated the way it gets treated, no matter what, there's, there's nothing else you can do with that money that's in an IRA at the time you pass. Okay. Well, and trust rates are awful, Rod. No one wants to pay trust rates on their tax. So that, that would be yeah. even worse. Okay. Well, yeah. We'll get into okay. That. So in, in the past, before the secure act was passed here a couple mm -hmm. years ago, 
you could stretch. So if, if my my wife is inheriting my IRA, if my kids are inheriting my IRA, my grandkids, then you can they get to decide how many years over how many years they want to take the money out. Yeah, right? they can literally stretch it over their lifetime if they yep. want. Yep. No longer. Okay. Uh, that's what I was about to say. They could have stretched that's it. That's right. But that's, that's gone. The IRS was like, you know what? We don't like this. We need some we need more money. And I've talked about this before, but when the IRS needs more money, they do it in the form of taxes. Yes. So this was a place where they're thinking, we can't really wait to get our taxes any longer. Let's let's eliminate this and get going. Yeah. And my take on this, like the Secure Act did a lot of things, like it was Donald Trump's thing, right? Yeah, um, talk about the Secure Act, Rod. Talk about like, uh, well, okay, maybe well, finish the IR, the stretch IRA part first. Well, yeah, let me actually uh, continue that though, because this is the act that gave us a lot of really cool stuff. But as you know, in Congress, nothing ever gets done in a straightforward way. Something gets proposed, and someone else doesn't like it, and they say, "Well, the only way, the only way I'm going to allow you to do this is if you give on something else over here." So that's what my thought is: is this is one of those things where it's like, "Well, if you're going to give benefits on on that side, we have to remove some kind of you know benefit on this other side." So but let's talk a little bit about the Secure Act and um, and with the emphasis on what it meant for IRAs. Okay, so what they did was they said. You, you can still take it over a period of time. It has to be 10 years. But by, or by the end of 10 years, you have to have removed all of the money out of that account and paid the tax on it. So um, I mean, it's just more more just like laying down the law. And there, there are a few exceptions to that. Uh, for the spouse, it can be different. If you, if mm -hmm. you have minor children under 21, until they become 21, it, it can be longer. Disabled people, chronically ill people, uh, individuals who are not more than 10 years younger than the IRA owner. So there are a few exceptions to this rule, but for the most part, it removes uh, any op option to do anything other than just making sure it's all out by the end of 10 years. Yep. Okay. So they, like you said, simply replaced the opportunity to stretch for most people in most situations and created that 10 year rule. Again, the idea is that they don't want to wait uh, indefinitely to get taxes. This way there's a, there's a, what's the right word? We'll call it a cliff, right? There's a tax yeah. cliff for us, which also means an opportunity for them to get more taxes. Okay, Rod. So on the secure act, we talked about it, killing stretch IRA. We talked about the 10 year payout. We've talked about exceptions for it. Mm -hmm. Are there any other points as it relates to the secure act that we need to hit on before we get into the more interesting stuff? Uh, I mean, maybe a couple of details. So if it has to be re removed by the end of 10 years, you could wait till year 10. I think most people would probably spread it out because they don't want to have, again, let's say it's a, a million dollars, $2 million passed to your you know, two kids or whatever. All of a sudden they each have a million dollars in this IRA account they just inherited. And they'll probably spread it out 100,000 a year for 10 years or whatever, right? Um, but even if, but if they didn't, if they were like, well, I'd, I'd rather just, you know, push this out as far as I can. If the person whose IRA originally was, was 72 years or older, as people may know that that is a critical age as it relates to IRAs, because you have to start taking some money out of it. They call it required minimum distributions. So if the deceased was 72 or older at the time they passed, then they, at the very minimum, the people who inherited it have to take the equivalent RMDs. Okay. You're just saying they have to stick with the RMDs that were already intact. Yep. Yep. Even if they're delaying taking the majority of it. Okay. So I think the, the thing for the listeners to be thinking about is one, do I have an IRA obviously, or qualified money, not just an IRA, mm -hmm. right? Like IRAs become IRAs oftentimes because they're, moved from a 401k or defined benefit plan or something else. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think the question to be asking yourself is, do I have qualified money? Um, what's my plan with it? Where is it? Uh, when do I believe that I'm likely to use it all or not? Um, mm -hmm. and then how do I feel about the taxation? What, when, I, cause again, the idea is it's deferral, a deferral. We've talked about tax deferrals in the recent episode, 
you still have to pay the tax there. It can be mm -hmm. an advantage, right? Because I have more money that can build. The question is, is it going to be an advantage from a tax standpoint? And obviously we don't know the answer to that with um, any, it's not definitive. Yep. However, because we're in a low tax bracket or we're in a low tax environment. And, and what I mean by that is if you look at historicals for the United States of America, we are in an, an exceptionally low point when you kind of take that overall look, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, that's those are the things to be thinking about. The, the likelihood is that taxes are going to go up. We've talked about that. Really, everybody agrees that taxes have to go up, not likely to go down. Yeah. So then the question, the next logical question is what to do with my IRAs and should I be building them up or not? So both of those questions I think are worth asking yourself as we talk through this. Absolutely. Okay, Rod. So we're going to talk about the, we need to talk about a Roth conversion first, right? Okay. So, so Roth conversions are pretty popular, fairly well known. If you're, uh, if you're into the money space at all, you know what a Roth conversion is. Basically it's taking a traditional IRA, converting it to a Roth and the IRS gives us the ability to do that. Uh, we have to pay the tax, but when we pay the tax, we then have changed our tax situation to where we no longer will have to pay the tax in the future. So if you believe that you, the taxes are lower today than they will be in the future, and, and especially if you're in an equal to or lower tax bracket than you expect to be in the future, then doing Roth conversions is a really smart way to future plan for your taxes. Absolutely. Okay. And, and obviously it's a lot better than um, leaving it in traditional IRAs. So Rod, I think that what we should do next is talk, uh, we should hear what Ed Slot has to say about um, Roth IRA conversions as a better alternative to le than leaving them in traditional IRAs. Perfect. Okay. Let's hear, let's hear what he has to say here. Roth conversions, tax insurance, because you never have to worry about the uncertainty of what future tax rates by, uh, might be. You pay taxes once and never again. Oh, I love his voice. I kind of want, I just kind of <laughs> wanting to keep going and listening to it. Uh, Ed Slot's great. Okay. So tax insurance. I love that idea. I hadn't thought of it in those terms, yeah. but basically you're moving from a situation where you don't know what the tax treatment is likely to be or going to be to a situation where you just know there's no more tax ever. It doesn't matter what the future holds. And so from that standpoint, it really, it's really powerful and it definitively is tax insurance. I know exactly what's happening after that. Yeah. And he also talked about the idea that it's, it's, tax risk diversification, right? Mm. In other words, you don't have to move all of it over. If you wanted to say, well, we'll move part of it over and leave some of it in the IRA, uh, you, you know, let's plan on social security, right? Or to speak of it as if it's really gonna be there. Um, social security will be partially taxable, right? Especially for high income earners. And so anyway, it, it just creates this, like, and he called it tax risk diversification by putting a chunk and for a lot of people, potentially a large chunk over into this Roth conversion, get, take advantage of that tax insurance. You make a really good point though, Rod, you don't want to do it all at the same time, right? So right. if I have a million, let's just go back with your example. I've got a, um, he calls them an XXL IRA. That That's mm -hmm. like over, over a million dollars or something like that is the mm -hmm. XXL. But let's just go with your example. We have a $2 million IRA. Well, especially if I'm a high income earner already, I probably don't want to take an additional $2 million of tax in the singular year, yeah. right? So what's the way to do it? Well, here's what I would do. Now, if you're already in the, tax, the, the top tax bracket and there's no, there's no changing that, then, then this probably doesn't matter as much. But strategically, um, assuming you're doing other things to reduce taxation, the, the way to handle this, or usually the advice we would give, is to take small amounts that go up to the next. So, so basically, you're going to, push up against the next tax bracket mm -hmm. without going over it. And that's a way to, it's not increasing your tax bracket. So it's not affecting other money, but you are still paying the tax right then and there on that money so that it can then go into the Roth IRA and no longer have tax from that point forward. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. One oh, other comment that he made. Uh, he, so he think about this, a lot of, a lot of people get really creative with gifting, mm -hmm. right? To, to again, start moving money out of their estate, move it to the kids. 
uh, do it under the annual exclusion limit. So for a couple, that's a little over 30,000 for right now. Um, but he was saying that this is actually better than doing the gifting. In other words, what happens is you, you pay the tax today so they don't have to pay it in the future. And in that case, there's no limit, right? That you don't have the annual exclusion as far as how much you can mm. gift. So if you move the hundred thousand and the tax you pay is is the thirty, great. But if you move five hundred thousand and and the tax you pay is larger, well, you just gifted mm, your kids that much thought. money that they don't have to pay in the future taxes. Especially, again, going back to this whole idea that that if income tax brackets are higher in the future, then you may have even uh, given them a better value than what you're paying in taxes today. Uh, I like it. That's an interesting thought. And and again, what are the one of the things that makes Ed unique is that he thinks about money different than a lot of people. And so that's mm -hmm. a really good idea. You, at, it, in essence, you're doing you're doing that anyway. So it helps to change the paradigm shift a little bit to be able to get a better view of the holistic and make good decisions that aren't just good decisions for today. Because here's the thing. Most people are just so used to throwing money in their qualified plans. We've been like, we've been hearing it preached to us for years and years and years. And so it just becomes the commonplace. And, and really in the physician community, Rod, it's still ultra prevalent. Like there's a, like everybody that I listen to, they say, max out your qualified plans first before you do anything else. And I'm just like, yeah. Oh, that is so backwards, right? Like it's not yeah. that it's not that there's no place for qualified plans. I always say this: there is a place, um, but as your like primary tool, eventually that's going to come back to bite you, and you're going to look at that and and regret the decision to put everything in IRAs. So going back to your point, Rod, it is really important to diversify. So if you're already overly um, invested in the qualified world in IRAs, then this conversation hopefully is a catalyst to make some moves and start thinking about how to slowly transition at least a portion of that money so that you're not in a tax trap come quote unquote retirement age. Yeah. Okay, Rod. So next thing, this is going to, this is going to be fun. I'm excited about this because we're obviously um, fans of life insurance mm -hmm. um, and we are fans of Roth conversions. In fact, when I was like, eight years old. And I don't know exactly what year the whole Roth, uh, Roths came in. My dad was a CPA though. And we didn't talk a ton about like my parents' personal financial situation. Mm -hmm. However, one of the things he told me was invest in Roth or use a Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know much about what that was at the time. I was probably like 10 or something. Right. Okay. But it was like, maybe I was 12. I can't remember, but it was, but he emphasized doing this. Well, my dad, the CPA, even at that point realized that Paying the tax today and never paying it again is far more advantageous than having to be riddled with potential tax concerns and all sorts of rules and regulations. And all basically, in the qualified world with IRAs, you're in business with the IRS for yeah. as long as that IRA is in existence. So, the question you have to ask yourself is do you want to be? Okay, good news. A Roth conversion helps tremendously. We're going to talk a little bit about how. Ed thinks life insurance is actually even better than doing a Roth conversion. So, Rod, why don't we get Ed's unbiased opinion to kick things off? One, because it brings in uh, tax-free planning. But probably the single best solution is life insurance planning. And again, if you don't know me, I'm a CPA, a tax advisor. I do not sell life insurance or annuities. I'm a tax advisor. I don't sell stocks, bonds, funds, insurance, annuities, none of that. But I have to tell you, and I should be preaching to the choir here, the tax exemption for life insurance is the single biggest benefit in the tax code and not used nearly enough. You have these great tools to use, and I put annuities in there as well for guaranteed income. Okay, Rod, so that's an awesome rant. And I can can I just say that if anybody didn't believe us, well, now we have third-party <laughs> validation. Ed said it himself, coming from the IR expert. Okay, Rod, talk to me, talk to us a little bit about why we view life insurance as such a powerful alternative to IRAs. And, and, and again, I just have to emphasize this. We're not all or nothing people. Mm -hmm. There is a place for different tools, but certainly what Ed is saying is 100% true. The question is why, right? Why would Ed be saying if you're going to, if stretch IRAs are dead, 
then mm -hmm. why would life insurance be a far more effective vehicle than even doing the Roth conversion? Okay, Rod, talk to us about your thoughts on that. Yeah, let's start with maybe the, the biggest point that he made with the Roth conversion, and that was the tax insurance. Mm -hmm. With the life insurance, this is tax insurance plus, 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 plus. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> it, it's more tax efficient. So, the, and these are the points that he made in, in that presentation. We're just kind of pulling yeah. from that. Obviously we know uh, a, a lot about this, but, um, it, and we admit like we're, we're biased, but it's great to hear it from an unbiased place. Right. It is. So, uh, it's more tax efficient than the Roth, right. Partly because oh, for a lot of reasons, but, but the biggest one, when that death benefit pays out, it pays out income tax free as well. Right. So, when we're not only talking about doing a conversion and having some account sitting out there, money in the cash value that could be accessed and used, but when that person passes away, it's now going to the to the kids, to the beneficiaries, this much larger number income tax free. Okay, Rod. So one of the really critical points that we have to hit on is the ability to invest out of the policy. So mm -hmm. here's what happens. Oftentimes people assume that the policy is the investment. We talk about how how money grows, right? We talk about in a whole life policy how how it grows by the through the dividend and the guaranteed interest rate. We talk mm -hmm. about IULs, how they grow through um, you know, being tied to a market index. But that's really not what we're talking about here. When we're moving money, the beauty is, is that we can turn it into a quote unquote investment optimizer. And when you understand that concept, now we're taking this money, we're funneling it into the policy, and then we're going and investing anywhere we want. And part of the reason that I think that's an advantage is because while you can invest in self-directed IRAs and go into the alternative market, it's much more free uh, and less limiting to do it directly from the policy. And when I say from the policy, I mean by taking policy loans against the general account of the insurance company, mm -hmm. we can then go invest anywhere we want, and we're getting many of the same tax benefits that we'd be getting otherwise. Plus, you know, if I go and invest in something like real estate, I'm adding this additional layer where I'm getting tax savings, not just, well, like I was before, where I was getting tax deferral. Yeah, that's a great point. Because who who doesn't want to be able to invest wherever they want, right? But the IRAs, a lot of the, unless you go self direct, like the, there are ways to get into real estate and keep it inside of the IRA. But for a lot of people, it, it gets messy because you have to get other people involved. Whereas in this case, our our clients who are using Investment Optimizer, it's 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 their money. They just grab it, they use it, they just you know invest in wherever they want with those dollars. Well, and and I made this point before, but you're still in bed with the irs so to speak right like that's still the chance so like and anyway the advantages just become larger and larger rod talk a little bit about gosh you have a through k uh -huh. so talk a little bit about at least touch on some of the benefits that using that life or, or some of the advantages of life insurance that ed mentioned yeah okay so we focused a lot on the income tax benefits with it yep well, then he went in and talked about the estate tax benefits that can come with life insurance that you can't get with either a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. Because remember, we talked earlier how that account is in your name. You can't move it into a trust, right? Yeah. For estate tax purposes, but you can move a life insurance policy. So, for example, you set up the life insurance policy, it's sitting inside of a, an islet, an irrevocable life insurance trust, or any irrevocable trust that you're doing for estate tax planning purposes. And now that is outside of your estate. So as it grows later on, when the death benefit pays out, all of that money passes to your beneficiaries through that trust, not through your estate. It's, it's now removed from your estate for, for estate tax purposes. Yeah. And that's massive by the Huge. way, Rod. It's a big deal. Yep. That's a big deal. Okay. Talk about a few more points. Okay. So let me actually bring up one other quote from him and then we'll Perfect. jump in because he he talks to people all the time about their estate planning. Mm -hmm. And so he brings up kind of these three key pieces that uh, that are brought up all the time. So let me okay. bring that up here. They always came out. They wanted three things. They wanted larger inheritances for their beneficiaries, more control for all the reasons I said. They don't want the kids squandering it, and they want control during their lives, which they can have with permanent cash value life insurance. I have that myself. I love the plan. You should have it for yourself, too. 
<laughs> yeah, so he tells us three things, right? And he says it repeatedly. Larger inheritance, more control, less tax. Yes. And, and then he says it again. Larger inheritance, more control, less tax. I think he even is like, say it with me. So it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting comment though, because again, if those if that's true and people really are focusing on wanting those three things, and I think that's that's fair to say, like life insurance ends up being the most powerful, uniquely positioned tool to do that. In, Pretty simple. Yeah, for all three of those things, even again, compared to the Roth, we often make that comparison from a tax standpoint between life insurance and a Roth. And yet he's differentiating and saying even better, even better than the Roth conversion, do a life insurance conversion and you get large, create that larger inheritance with the death benefit, at the very least you have more control for the reasons we talked about earlier, because you're not in bed with the IRS. You're not uh, subject to whatever rules they have currently and and could change in the future, right? Uh, and then and then less tax for all the reasons we've talked about, both on the income tax side and on the estate tax side. Rod, you brought up a good point. What Ed was asked a question like, "Hey, can I count on these new tax rules?" And he was like, "No, absolutely not. You can't." <laughs> uh, and I, I not when Congress is in so, control. Well, but it brings up a really <laughs> important point. So if we can't trust that we know what taxes are going to look like in the future. We don't know what the rules are. We don't know if suddenly they're going to drop a benefit. That we're, well, why not end up in a position where there aren't any taxes to mess with, right? Yeah. That's yep. really the whole power of it. Okay, so if you're listening to this, the question is, what should I be doing? Um, we He had a couple of ideas, Rod. Do you want to talk about the couple of ideas that uh, Ed suggested? Yeah, well, m maybe first we should talk about the... Uh... Well, he he compared he made a comparison. He said the IRAs are like an old jalopy. <laughs> Life insurance is the luxury limo. And that I think so great. Specifically when you talked about that, because think about how IRAs came to be, like back in the late 70s, up to that point, pretty much everyone had pensions and things like that, right? Pensions, social security, you were taken care of for life. And then they decided, oh, but wouldn't it be better? I'm using air quotes better. If everybody has more control of their own accounts, they can decide where it's invested, et cetera, et cetera. So this all this all of a sudden this new 401k IRA world comes to be. And and I, I guess, you know, according to, to Ed, he's saying it, it kind of had its heyday, but it's yeah. been eroded. And with changes, especially like this one, all of a sudden it's an old jalopy and he showed a, a picture of, you know, a, a 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> BMW, but it was all beat up and, and the paint job was horrible and it was broke down on the side of the road and then compared that to the luxury limo, which which he's saying <laughs> is the life funny. insurance, right? So you get well, all the bells and whistles. It's not I just love down. it, it's Rod. Not down. I just love it. Okay, so so yeah, we've got the broken down, the the beater BMW. By the way, I I personally love BMWs, but but if it's from the 1950s, it's still an old jalopy. Yeah, there's you don't not jalopy. many. There's not many people that I've heard call life insurance a luxury limo, Rod. <laughs> and yeah. I especially didn't expect to hear it from our friend Ed Slot. So yeah. for that reason, I just felt like ah, oh, we have to share this. It's just too good not to share with people. Uh, but a couple of points before we take off for the day. Here's some things to think about. If this is you and you have a ton of IRA money, um, and by the way, like this is a lot of people that we meet with. Mm -hmm. partially because many people that we talk to kind of see the alternative investment light maybe a little bit later. So as an mm -hmm. example, if I'm a, if I'm a surgeon and I've been, and I have a defined benefit plan and I've been sticking $150,000 a, a year in it for the last eight or 10 years, I might have, you know, a couple million bucks in that. That's totally common for the type of people we meet with. So mm -hmm. again, back to the point, what should I be considering doing? Realizing that, that IRAs are, um, at least a tax bomb, at least somewhat of a tax bomb, right? It, we can manage them to a degree, but like it's going to go off at some point. So what do yeah. I do? Here's what Ed said. He said, divert working income to, and, and it could be a Roth IRA too, right? That would be far better than a traditional or a qual or a, or, or like a 401k. So Roth first, but what he suggested is divert some of your working income to life insurance. Not only that, but he suggested doing life insurance conversions. Again, Roth conversions are a good step, but according to Ed, a life insurance conversion is even more powerful. And of course, the benefit is, like we've talked about, you can invest anywhere you want without 
all of the restrictions and mess that goes with investing with the IRS. Yeah. Okay. So divert while you're working still. Uh-huh. And then when you get past 59 and a half and you can start moving that money out of the IRA without the 10% penalty. Okay. Good you, point. You start moving that into the, the existing IRA money into life insurance. Okay. Thank you, Rod. I'm glad that you put that out there because before we, t- before we take off, we're going to touch on this. Obviously you don't want to do life con- life insurance conversions before 59 and a half, because as I do that, well, I don't have the benefit of the tax rules around the Roth conversion. So if I'm pre 59 and a half and I'm doing conversions, it could make more sense to, well, I shouldn't say that it is, it does make more sense at that stage to do a Roth conversion as I get past that 59 and a half and I don't have to deal with that 10% tax rule anymore. That's when it really makes sense to, to move it into life insurance. Is that fair to say? It is. And we see people do that in a couple of different ways. Uh, We have a lot of clients who start policies in their 60s. So that's great, right? You could put it on yourself. And we also have a lot of clients who will start putting policies on their children, their adult children. So that, again, taking that same money, taking it out, pay the tax, and now they're doing this life life insurance conversion with policies on their children, building this cash value. They have access into it for their lives. When they pass, this income tax-free death benefit passes on to the grandchildren. So anyway, this whole kind of multi-generational legacy planning concept using life insurance in life insurance conversion from the IRA. Okay, Rodney, this has been fun. Um, I always like when other people validate our thoughts and opinions. And like I said, I just did not expect it coming from Ed Slot, America's IRA expert. So uh, without further ado, Rod, just remember IRAs are the old jalopy. Life insurance is the luxury limo. And uh, we'll catch you next week on the Money Insights Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Money Insights Podcast. To learn more about the financial and business strategies discussed in this show, please visit moneyinsights.net. The views and opinions expressed on the Money Insights podcast are not intended to be individual financial, tax, or legal advice. Always consult with the appropriate advisor before making financial decisions. And if you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This will help others find the show and learn wealth building strategies for themselves. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Let's do it.